5. The Decline from Weight to Name, Encouraging Bank Inflation The natural tendency of the state is inflation. This statement will shock those accustomed to viewing the state as a committee of the whole nation ardently dispensing the general welfare, but I think it nonetheless true. The reason seems to be obvious. As I have mentioned above, money is acquired on the market by producing goods and services, and then buying money in exchange for these goods. But there is another way to obtain money, creating money oneself without producing, by counterfeiting. Money creation is a much less costly method than producing. Therefore, the state, with its ever-tightening monopoly of money creation, has a simple route that it can take to benefit its own members and its favored supporters. And it is a more enticing and less disturbing route than taxes, which might provoke open opposition. Creating money, on the contrary, confers open and evident benefits on those who create and first receive it. The losses it imposes on the rest of society remain hidden to the lay observer. This tendency of the state should alone preclude all the schemes of economists and other writers for government to issue and stabilize the supply of paper money. While countries were still on a specie standard, banknotes and government paper were issued as redeemable in specie. They were money substitutes, essentially warehouse receipts for gold that could be redeemed in face value on demand. Soon, however, the issue of receipts went beyond 100% reserve to outright money creation. Governments have persistently tried their best to promote, encourage, and expand the circulation of bank and government paper, and to discourage the people's use of gold itself. Any individual bank has two great checks on its creation of money, a call for redemption by non-clients, that is, by clients of other banks, or by those who wish to use standard money, and a crisis of confidence in the bank by its clients, causing a run. Governments have continually operated to widen these limits, which would be narrow in a system of free banking a system where banks are free to do anything they please so long as they promptly redeem their obligations to pay specie. They have created a central bank to widen the limits to the whole country by permitting all banks to inflate together under the tutelage of the government, and they have tried to assure the banks that the government will not permit them to fail either by coining the convenient doctrine that the central bank must be a lender of last resort or reserves to the banks, or, as in America, by simply suspending specie payments, that is, by permitting banks to continue operations while refusing to redeem their contractual obligations to pay specie. It is a commonly accepted myth that the excess of wildcat banks in America stemmed from free banking. Actually, a much stronger cause was the tradition, beginning in 1814 and continuing in every economic crisis thereafter, of permitting banks to continue in operation without paying in specie. It is also a widespread myth that central banks are inaugurated in order to check inflation by commercial banks. The Second Bank of the United States, on the contrary, was inaugurated in 1817 as an inflationist sop to the state chartered banks, which had been permitted to run riot without paying in specie since 1814. It was a weak substitute for compelling a genuine return to specie payments, this was correctly pointed out at the time by such hard-money stalwarts as Daniel Webster and John Randolph of Roanoke. Senator William H. Wells, Federalist of Delaware, said that the bank bill was ostensibly for the purpose of correcting the diseased state of our paper currency by restraining and curtailing the over-issue of bank paper, and yet it came prepared to inflict upon us the same evil being itself nothing more than simply a paper-making machine. As for the Federal Reserve System, the major arguments for its adoption were to make the money supply more elastic 
and to centralize reserves and thus make them more efficient, that is, to facilitate and promote inflation. As an additional fillip, reserve requirements themselves were directly lowered at the inauguration of the Federal Reserve System. Another device used over the years by governments was to persuade the public not to use gold in their daily transactions. To do so was scorned as an anachronism, unsuited to the modern world. The yokel who didn't trust banks became a common object of ridicule. In this way, gold was more and more confined to the banks and to use for very large transactions. This made it very much easier to go off the gold standard during the Great Depression, for then the public could be persuaded that the only ones to suffer were a few selfish, antisocial, and subtly unpatriotic gold hoarders. In fact, as early as the Panic of 1819, the idea had spread that someone trying to redeem his banknote in specie, that is, to redeem his own property, was a subversive citizen trying to wreck the banks and the entire economy, and by the 1930s it was thus easy to denounce gold hoarders as virtual traitors. During the panic, the economist Condi Raguet, state senator from Philadelphia, wrote to a puzzled David Ricardo as follows. You state in your letter that you find it difficult to comprehend why persons who had a right to demand coin from the banks in payment of their notes so long forbore to exercise it. This no doubt appears paradoxical to one who resides in a country where an act of parliament was necessary to protect a bank but the difficulty is easily solved. The whole of our population are either stockholders of banks or in debt to them. An independent man who was neither a stockholder or debtor, who would have ventured to compel the banks to do justice, would have been persecuted as an enemy of society. In 1931, for example, President Hoover launched a crusade against traitorous hoarding, the crusade consisted of the Citizens' Reconstruction Organization, headed by Colonel Frank Knox of Chicago, and Jesse Jones reports that during the banking crisis of early 1933, Hoover was seriously contemplating invoking a forgotten wartime law making hoarding a criminal offense. It should also be noted here that the Hoover administration's alleged devotion to retaining the gold standard is largely myth. As Hoover's Undersecretary of the Treasury has declared rather proudly, the going off gold cannot be laid to Franklin Roosevelt. It had been determined to be necessary by Ogden Mills, Secretary of the Treasury, and myself as his Undersecretary, long before Franklin Roosevelt took office. And so, by imposing central banking, by suspending specie payments, and by encouraging a shift among the public from gold to paper or bank deposits in their everyday transactions, the governments organized inflation, and thus an ever larger proportion of money substitutes to gold, an increasing proportion of liabilities redeemable on demand in gold to gold itself. By the 1930s, in short, the gold standard a shaky gold base supporting an ever greater pyramid of monetary claims, was ready to collapse at the first severe depression or wave of bank runs. Currently, the worst example of government aid to banks is the highly popular deposit insurance, for this means that banks have virtually carte blanche from government to protect them from any redemption crisis. As a result, virtually all natural market checks on bank inflation have been destroyed. Query. If banks are thus protected from losses by government, to what extent are they still private institutions? 6. 100% Gold Banking we have thus come to the cardinal difference between myself and the bulk of those economists who still advocate a return to the gold standard. These economists, represented by Dr. Walter E. Spar and his associates in the Economists' National Committee on Monetary Policy, essentially believe that the old pre-1933 gold standard was a fine and viable institution in all its parts, and that going off gold in 1933 